bilingual education I think came out in the 1950s and it was there was a, a, an attempt to address the situation for uh, Latinos children uh, in particular uh, how they were not able to uh, assimilate uh, and, or, or graduate uh, and it, it was successful it increased it to 50 percent but right now 50 percent is just not enough so they started looking at uh, what what is the problem uh, and they they went back to the drawing board and tried to figure out okay what is it that we can do to to fix this and there was a study done by uh, uh, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Cull here uh, about this thing called dual language and in this study it was a 12-year study and they took I think like 50,000 kids and they trained them in this this model that they come up with um, called dual language and they found out that not only were they outscoring or, or um, beating the medium of, of mainstream America they were outscoring them even though they only had the program up to fifth grade and then that afterwards when it comes to standard academic testing like the SAT the ACT whatnot they were outscoring them they found out that people that can speak academically two languages they're they're doing better so the problem with bilingual education especially here in South Texas is that what's common is called the early transitional model the early transitional model tries to take Spanish dominant kids and as quickly as possible turn them into English speaking kids whether they are ready for it or not so what we're finding out uh, is that kids are not reading on grade level and the question is why and a lot of principals and administrators and several communities are saying well why is it well let me ask you this if I sent you to Russia to be a brain surgeon mm -hmm. would you be able to read a textbook in Russian no, I'd probably have to read. You probably have a tough time. Books. Any one of us would probably have Absolutely. a tough time with that. Absolutely. Now, what if instead I gave you that same textbook, but I gave it to you in English? <laughs> would that lighten the load? Yeah. Sure. So, what we're doing to our kids right now is we're giving them double the work. We're not only not giving them the content, we're not giving them the language, and we're scratching heads and wondering why they're not learning. How about instead we build up their native language? How about we give them what the skills they need in the language they need and at the same time build up their English. So that's what we're doing with dual language. The model is set up, it's fairly complex, but not really. It's <laughs> <laughs> Here's how it works. Certain subjects in dual language are taught exclusively in one language. Yeah, that explains some of it there. Uh, for example, math is exclusively done in English. Regardless if you speak Spanish or English, it is done in English. But your question is, well, how do you, how do the Spanish dominant kids uh, succeed in this thing? We have them paired, so that say I am a, an English dominant and she speaks Spanish and English, she helps me. Hmm. Okay, well actually, well, I make it, I'm Spanish, I'm Spanish dominant, she speaks both. <laughs> she helps me in math. Now comes science and social studies time, it's done exclusively in Spanish. So now she needs my help. Hmm. That's awesome. So you're creating synergy. Exactly. And you're creating a, a way for them to get the best of both worlds. Basically. Exactly. And not only that, we shift the role of the, of the teacher from a teaching to making sure you got to learn this to the children teaching each other right. and the teacher shifting to more of a facilitator. Sure. Because the kids are much better teachers than we could ever be. They can explain to them way than they can understand. And what does it do to your knowledge when you have to teach it to somebody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens to achievement with this model? In addition to that, and I don't know why I say it's complicated, they receive language arts exclusively in their native language up until second grade. So if I have a room full of Spanish dominant kids, they're going to have a language arts exclusively in Spanish until the end of first grade. In second grade, they're going to get both Spanish and in English. Uh, the opposite is true for English language, uh, I mean, uh, English dominant children. They have English language arts up until the end of first grade. In the beginning of second grade, they receive both. So they're both getting it. They're both getting, you know, they're getting their foundation at first so that you can read that textbook mm -hmm. you know, in, in Russian because you have the skills and, and the language 
uh, I'm sorry, you have this basic skills now. Now all you have to do is work on the language. And instead of forcing one out in place of the other, I'm building up both. And according to what we're seeing, and which is the model you see in front of you, the graph there, you you see that uh, actually we didn't highlight all of it. This is this is the baseline of, of mainstream America, and the model we're using is these top two. One is called the dual uh, one way, and the other one's called two way dual language. Uh, the the difference between the two is not really much. It just has to do with your demographics. If we had a balance between English and Spanish speakers, we'd be using a two way. Since we have more Spanish speakers, we use a one way. Um, and this is pretty well explained in the, in the literature that you have here. Now, the other thing that, that the particular model we use is called Gomez and Gomez. Uh, they figured that, that there was a problem with that kids were not internalizing the, the language well outside of the classroom. So they came up with this thing called language of the day. And they decided that on certain days, you speak when you're outside the content area, like you're in the lunch area or you're in PE or you're in the hallway, the language of the day will be spoken. So today, I'm not wearing my shirt, but she <laughs> is. It's a, a blue shirt day, and, the, and then we color-coded the day. So the blue shirt day is an English day. See, I was going out to the community <laughs> today, day. so I wore my community shirt today. <laughs> um, and you can see here in the pictures, they're all wearing their that blue shirts. Tuesday, so right? this was a, a Tuesday or Thursday, so this was an English day. Yeah. Um, and tomorrow will be a red shirt day, which means that in the hallways or in, in, the, in the cafeteria or in PE, the language of the day is Spanish, so they'll be working on uh, whatever they learn during the day. And I make it a point to uh, whoever's supervising the kids during lunchtime, Make sure they're speaking in whatever the language of the day is. And I go in there most of the days and I say, good morning or buenos dias. And say, hoy es or today is. And they answer and I say, what language are you going to speak today? And I pull my shirt and they say, whatever language is for the day. Uh, so that's how the program is working. We, this is our first year rolling the program out. I expect great things. Uh, so far, so good. I think the biggest thing... Um, that we have is the fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. both as far as our teachers and our community is concerned. That's why we had uh, a three-day training from the Gomez and Gomez uh, brothers. Uh, one's a, uh, Dr. Richard Gomez from UTB. The other one is Dr. Leo Gomez from UTPA. Uh, we had a three-day training here in this room for uh, my first cohort of teachers, which was pre-K through first. And in the summer, I had uh, another three-day training for them and everybody else, uh, my bus drivers included, my, sec my support staff, uh, myself. I've been to it four times now. Um, and they all had it. Be why? Because we all interact with our community. We all need to be advocates, and we all need to get rid of the fear and the doubt of what this is, and more importantly, what it is not. Mm-hmm.